So hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now if you're watching this on the 31st of August 2021, we're a few hours away from the new Shimano 12-speed Dura Ace and possibly Ultegra group set reveal at I think Eurobike. I'm going to do this video before the launch to give you my predictions of what we might see, have they fixed the power meter, have they fixed the cranks and have they improved road disc brakes and then we'll see what I've got right, what I've got wrong and maybe do another video afterwards. Anyway, Try and watch this before the launch if you can, so like and subscribe as soon as you see this video and watch it before they do the launch. So let's start off with the, the important things about this, this group set, really is the disc brakes and the performance compared to the last generation. Now, road disc brakes, I've always said that they've not really been there in terms of the quality and the performance that we were expecting. Um, they haven't really lived up to what you get in the mountain bike arena. They're inconsistent. The pad clearance is, in my eyes, too small. The, the, the performance and the, the braking power and force is good, but the pad clearance, lever ratios, I think have all been a bit off, and it all comes back to thermal management, heat management anyway. So what we can see from these new ones is that the hoods are much, much bigger, and that's a real shame. We see from SRAM and Campy, the hoods are massive, and Shimano, I think, in the current generation, R8000, 9100, the hoods are pretty good, but maybe they've had to sacrifice some of that space, put a, last, a larger reservoir in there, a larger master piston, to modify the lever ratio to give the same mechanical advantage, so the same piston force at the caliper, but increase the pad clearance. And that's what it all comes down to, is that when these things get really hot on long descents, and the pros will say it as well, the pad clearance is too small, you get ticking, you get rubbing, uh, the pistons retract a little bit inconsistently, and have they had to make the hoods bigger to modify the mechanical advantage and the lever ratio um, or keep that the same, but make the pad clearance bigger. Who knows? Um, there has to be a reason why they've made the hoods bigger. Is it to do with the, the wireless function of the DI2? Maybe there's a coin cell in there as well, but they look pretty damn ugly. And if you look at these Ultegra ones, they're ferociously ugly. They look huge and awful, in my opinion. The, there will be, I think, a Dura Ace rim brake group set because Ineos are always going to use rim brake. There's a new Pinarello rim brake bike, which Ineos will probably still use. So, and I think this is a picture of a Dura Ace rim brake shifter. Looks pretty good. Hood looks really small. But the Hydro ones, even the Dura Ace ones, look bigger than what we've currently got. And I just think they look ugly, to be honest. That's my opinion. The caliper has gone to a monoblock design. What's monoblock? Well, that basically means it's machined in one piece. There's no split line down the middle of the caliper. Uh, that's good. It makes the caliper a little bit stiffer because when the pistons are pushing in on the disc, there's a reaction force outwards, which is trying to cleave the caliper apart. I've never thought that's been a problem. I've always thought they've been stiff enough. Even on the XT big mountain bike brakes that I've got, they're a split caliper design, never really had a problem. Maybe it helps with thermal management a bit, not having that split line in the machining and clamping them two together. Um, it's going to make them a bit stiffer, possibly a bit lighter as well. The piston assembly, so both sides of the caliper are pushed in from one side and then blanked off with that kind of big Torx kind of style nut that we see on like Hope uh, calipers. A few less bits of hardware in there, a few less bolts as well holding the thing together, which is nice. The hoods, like I said, they're absolutely huge and awful, but they are ribbed for your riding pleasure. Is that bigger hood necessary to really achieve, even with the servo wave kind of technology we see in the mountain bike brakes from Shimano, is that bigger hood needed for the increased pad clearance and mechanical advantage and lever ratio mechanics of the brakes. Now let's move on to this kind of the other biggest thing about the group set for me is Shimano cranks and power meters. Now I'm a power meter specialist, more or less what my engineering background is. Shimano power meters, you might not like me saying this, but Shimano power meters have all been flawed up until now if you're using a dual sided power meter. And why do I say that? Well, the asymmetric nature of a Shimano drive side crank means it's very hard to cancel the parasitic bending strains you get on the strain gauges. Now the non-drive side crank, whether it's a 6800, 8000, 9000 or 9100 crank, they're more or less symmetric. And when you've got the strain gauges, like this is a stages one, when you've got the strain gauges positioned either side of the center line, you get a good output in terms of the torque where you want it, so your pedaling torque, but also you get very good cancellation in the axial load case from rider weight and the inboard bending from the offset of the pedal. The strain gauge assembly or the strain gauge layout can be suitable to cancel those parasitic bending strains, which is good, otherwise you'd get erroneous torque and power readings, right? On the drive side cranks, we've seen with 6800, R8000 and 9100, there's been real problems even with the Shimano themselves 
instrumenting those cranks to get reliable power readings. And that all comes from crank asymmetry. They are not symmetrical down the center line. So although the in-plane torque measurement is good because you still get an output from the Wheatstone bridge, the cancellation of parasitic forces, like I said, axial loading on the crank, which doesn't propel you forward, inboard bending of the crank, which doesn't propel you forward, are giving strain gauge outputs. You're getting voltage outputs in the Wheatstone bridges, which aren't cancelled, which is why the Shimano cranks never really worked as dual-sided power meters. If you're looking for a Shimano crank, get a single-sided one on the non-drive side. They tend to work pretty well, whether it's stages or four eyes. But Shimano themselves have never really been able to instrument dual-sided power meters very well on their own cranks. And that all comes from basically they're not designed to be torque transducers in the first place. So what do we see on these new ones uh, with Ultegra and Dura Ace? Yep, down the center line of the crank, the crank is almost perfectly, well, it will be symmetrical. So any parasitic bending strains you've got from axial loads, twisting or offset pedal loads, the strain gauge has got more of a chance to cancel them. Now, if you want to learn about Wheatstone bridges and uh, strain cancellation and strain voltage outputs, I've got a very old video on all different power meters and how they work. Go and check that one out and it explains to you how strain gauges and Wheatstone bridges work. But that's why we're seeing more regular symmetrical um, geometries of the new cranks versus the asymmetry and the more arty shapes of the old ones. Now, the other thing about the crank sets is we keep seeing, even in the current generation cranks from Shimano, debonding failures. So these type of cranks are actually bonded um, from basically two shells of aluminium. And they're bonded around the edge with a strip of epoxy. And we've seen failures on older ones like 6800, and we keep seeing failures on R8000 and even the new 9100. So I really hope they, well, I hope they nip that in the bud before they made the current generation. And Shimano are still basically ignoring this failure. They've not commented on it. You see so many failures. I know four or five friends, and I'd only have four or five friends that have failed these cranks. There seems to be kind of moisture ingress or corrosion ingress in the bond line, and then the thing just peels away. And once it started to peel, there's a pretty cat catastrophic failure of the aluminium. I would genuinely be concerned about buying another pair of Shimano cranks. If I was looking for a pair of cranks to buy nowadays, I probably wouldn't buy a Shimano uh, bonded crank, actually, because the failures are so prevalent now. I've seen so many cranks debond, and it seems to happen at the start of the spider where moisture gets into the bond line and then that half of the, the shell kind of peels away and the epoxy fails. I'd still prefer probably a carbon crank uh, or just a basic heavier forged aluminium crank. They're never going to fail. Or a CNC crank like a rotor Aldi or something like that. Now it really is the headline thing, but for me it's kind of the least exciting thing is, yeah, it's now 12 speed. Like, who really cares? You're still going to get people. And this reminds me of that. Uh... Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. You're still going to get people who think 12 speed the extra gear is going to make them go faster. You know, you can turn it up another notch if it's got another number on it. It isn't going to make you go any faster. Okay, it's just another ratio. I've never had a problem with 11 speed. I think Shimano themselves were like, oh, for fuck's sakes. When SRAM and Campy went to 12 speed, I think they were like, oh, fuck it, we'll have to make 12 speed, otherwise we're not going to sell. But really, who needs 12 speed? I think we may be able to use the same free hub. I don't think we're going to need a micro spline free hub like we do on mountain bikes. I might be wrong, a little bird little birdie told me you'll be able to use your same free hubs. I'm not so sure yet. We'll have to find out after the release in a few hours. Um, but the only good thing about the 12-speed cassette is there seems like they haven't gone to the stupid, stupid 10-tooth cog like SRAM did. We've got normal size chain rings on Ultegra and Dura Ace, so the ratios and you know the smallest tooth at the back will probably be 11, which is, which is a good thing. So the ratios are more or less the same with normal size chain rings. And like I said, it does seem to be a rim brake option, which is always a benefit in my eyes because I like rim brakes. Pure and simple. If you think I've missed anything, yeah, there's a few more kind of boring details like the derailleur's a different colour or there's some different materials, blah, blah, blah. Let me know down in the comments below. As ever, please do like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel and I'll see you in the next one. And I'm really looking forward to Shane, GP Lama, getting hold of the new Shimano power meters and then putting through all the tests and benchmarking like he's done. That is one of the most 
valuable resources, I think, amateur cyclists have on power meters because there's so much marketing bullshit out there. Um, go and check out his channel, go and check out all of his benchmarks. And if you just want a, a brief summary of all the power meters, check out his website as well. It's a much easier way to digest um, the current state of the power meter market, basically. Cheers and see you in the next one.